comes in. Let me go. Okay, so Ava, we can go ahead and open up the waiting room. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll give folks just a moment here to get connected to audio. Perfect. Welcome to today's training. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Jeffrey Franco, and I'm the communications director for the University of Arizona Sonoran Center for Excellence and Disabilities. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items to run through. For today's session, we have live captions generously provided by the University of Arizona Disability Resource Center. To access caption options, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the meeting screen. Throughout today's session, please feel free to use the chat box if you have any questions or wish to share. You can also raise your hand if you would like to share verbally. To raise your hand, you can click on the reactions button at the bottom of the meeting screen and then click raise hand. If you are joining us via phone, you can also dial star nine to raise your hand that way. If you have any technical issues throughout today's training, please feel free to message the Sonoran Center in the chat. Our team is there to help. Finally, on behalf of the Sonoran Center, I would like to read the university's land acknowledgement statement. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the O'odham and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Now, without further ado, I will respectfully hand it over to my colleague, Jim Warren, to kick off today's training. Jim? Ah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Lizzie. And uh, I really appreciate our team at the Center for Indigenous Empowerment. And the reason we call it empowerment is that I think is what we're all here for is to empower our people with disabilities. And uh, I really appreciate everyone attending today. And we'll be closing today for a few minutes with a mini virtual talking circle, which we had to create as a result of COVID because we couldn't do our talking circles that we usually use to do the discussion formats, uh, um, you know, just to be able to get a cultural approach to getting that data and information that's needed for our tribal communities. And the empowerment aspect of what we do at Sonoran Center for our Native Center and the Indigenous approach to disability work is to indigenize that approach so that it works for Indian country. And that's what we uh, really specialize in. And that's kind of what I wanted when we formulated this program. It is uh, something that empowers all Indian people, but in this case, we're focusing on a subgroup of people with disabilities in Indian country. So unfortunately, we as tribal members, we have the highest rate of disability than any other cultural group in the United States. Now, there's many reasons for that, and that would be another lecture on healthcare disparities, the poverty issues, the rural aspects, the government to government relationships, all of these elements that we in Indian country know how to maneuver, but not necessarily our non Indian partners and allies that we have may not have that. So that's why it's so important to have a collective partnership of other tribal programs, but as well as our non-Indian allies and partners out there that really wanna make a difference for uh, tribal members with disability. So I really appreciate uh, everyone coming on and joining us. I'm gonna share my screen now, hopefully successfully. <laughs> uh, I need my grandson here. He knows how to do all this stuff, but 
Uh, hopefully that is uh, showing okay there. Thumbs up, uh, Yvette, I see you on my screen, or Mel, thumbs up, can you see? All right, there we go. Um, here we are uh, addressing creative employment strategies, and I've invited three guest lecturers to share their perspectives on employment for Indian country for our tribal members with disability. Um, I wear many hats as a uh, confused person, I, <laughs> I often say, but it's wonderful to be able to apply the majority of my work that focuses on two cultures that are very valuable to me personally, and that is our indigenous culture and our disability culture. I do this work in honor of my father, Jim Sr., and uh, he used a wheelchair for many years and he was an advocate and fighting for rights for not only himself, but our little neighborhood in Tempe got curb cuts and other uh, access elements so that he could ride down to the corner store and not be stuck at home. And this was pre-ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. And so I'm really proud of my dad because he really showed me what true strength was. He's the strongest man I knew. Uh, he's, he just happened to use a wheelchair. Now I'm obviously biased because he's my father, but boy, was it empowering for me as an eight and nine year old to see him roll up to people parking in the handicap spot at the store and saying, hey, I'm glad to give you my parking spot, but give me your legs, your ability to walk and you can park here. And what was that? I mean, my goodness, the reactions of people, he did it many times, but how was that for me as a young person to witness that? Did that give me a sense of empowerment, advocacy? These words I didn't really know yet, but I knew this, what it meant, because I knew Pops was more than his wheelchair. So again, Pops, Jim Sr., well done. Thank you so much for guiding me and providing me an opportunity to work in the disability world. Now I'm with my new crew in Arizona. I'm back, Arizona. Hey. Uh, it's wonderful to create this circle of indigenous empowerment, and it's based on our program in South Dakota, but it's essentially a sub-center within the Sonoran Center of Disabilities that provides an indigenous approach to disability services and creating the partnerships and the uh, different approaches to disability services. And today we're discussing uh, empowerment with employment. So it is wonderful to have the uh, different perspectives that we'll have here today. And this is through our Native Center for Disabilities that's under the umbrella of the uh, Circle of Indigenous Empowerment. So it's wonderful to get all these different programs and hiring. We're uh, actually uh, the job announcements out. So we need a new director or a new manager, excuse me, for the uh, Native Center. So please get that out to your folks. We're looking for quality uh, people, uh, particularly folks that know tribal issues and uh, um, most uh, ideally would be a tribal member with a disability. So uh, we'll have that out as well. And then our Finds Their Way program, Joshua is on a meeting now with the uh, Department of Labor and uh, some work that we're doing with them and ODEP, Office of Disability Employment Policy. So there we're working on a national scale of advocacy, but also providing examples and some models that work in Indian country so that they can uh, uh, provide these services. And I mentioned the Oyate Circle. Uh, Oyate means the people in my language. And this is in South Dakota. And this was our, the, we are sister programs, these two programs now. And I'm hoping to grow it to the North uh, uh, East as well as the East Coast to address a national scale of disability issues. Uh, this was our youth camp this summer, our Alpha Youth Camp for pre-employment services so that they can prepare to not only graduate, but have support from Voc Rehab and other employment programs so that they have options after they graduate. So this is a wonderful week-long summer program that I'm hoping to get funded for year round so that we can work with them. Uh, here's uh, Wayne and I, and then on another note, Wayne uh, has uh, recently moved on to other work, a bigger calling, if you will, on the cultural side. So I'm looking for another quality native person in South Dakota. So got a couple of positions open if uh, folks have people that are interested in working in our disability community. And then here's a picture of us at, uh, oh, where is it? Sintagleshka University in South Dakota working with our youth. And we do a lot of work with our youth because we're our very young population as 
Indian country. And we wanna make sure these youth not only get an opportunity to get through school, but start looking at the world bigger than just surviving high school and then doing something on the res. We want them to be able to have options on the res as well as outside. And I think uh, our vocational rehabilitation is a great example of that support on the res with options to stay either home on the res or gain those skills, not only employment, but culturally to be an urban Indian like me, <laughs> uh, to be out here living off the res, but still having that Lakota heart or indigenous heart, but still able to work and operate in America. So I'm very proud of our new programs and uh, with our new Arizona program and the South Dakota program, my dream now is to get a national center. Uh, since we're serving the 22 tribal nations in Arizona, we're starting to grow our webinar series national as well, as well as uh, South Dakota, we're doing a lot of work nationally with other programs. So uh, maybe my dream when I limp off into the sunset someday will be a wonderful national uh, center for disabilities that is a fully inclusive program uh, with a variety of people addressing different issues of disability in Indian country. So I mentioned Arizona, you're very aware of this. Arizona is 20, almost 25% uh, of Arizona is Indian land. So there's a lot of uh, Indian impact in Arizona in terms of policy, uh, politics, you know, um, not only tribal politics, but our state and federal politics impression with that representation of Indian country. And how do we vote in terms of impacting our uh, disability rights for Indian country? So something we always need to do is we many times on a national level, they tend to want to homogenize us as Indians. Oh, do you speak Indian? Well, there's 200 languages, so which one do you wanna select? So often when they go, hey, do you speak Indian? I go, I don't know, do you speak European? You know, I mean, they need to understand that we're such a diverse community that Indian country is not homogenized. We are indeed a diverse population with different cultures, languages, and approach to disability as well. And then the different aspects of what employment means for these communities is also unique. For instance, creative employment, I was going back to my old dictionary of occupational titles. Anyone old enough to remember that in Voc Rehab? There was a dictionary of occupational titles. And as a student, they were saying, find some unique employment. And I found chicken de-beaker. Has anyone had a job of chicken de-beaker? Uh, obviously, that's a unique job. <laughs> and the Dictionary of Occupational Titles is no longer used. But, um, you know, that was something to make me think, what are unique jobs in Indian country that may not be appropriate here in Mission Bay, San Diego? you know, as a different approach to employment. So again, on the national scale, and many of the speakers will be relate to this, is we're always jumping through hoops when we're working with our national, particularly our federal government. So I compare it to the hoop dancers. We have to be very skilled to be able to get through these hoop and create that circle of support for Indian country. And then sovereignty is very key. We need to make sure that our sovereignty is intact so that we can continue as tribal nations and have those federal rights and government to government relationships. And, uh, and that's a big effort right now uh, by many states and federal agencies, or not agencies, but just programs that want to kind of eliminate our sovereignty or minimize it. So they're going with the divide and conquer as they've always done. But I think it's very important for us to all remember how important sovereignty is. We had fought for this for over 200 years. And we're in the constitution and we need to remember that we have that self-determination as Indian people on how we want our employment services to go for Indian country. So that's why I want empowerment, empowerment for our people and sovereignty is part of that. So here's our structure. Uh, we're supposed to be first with the in line, but our states have kind of moving up past us as Indian nations within the constitutional makeup. So again, there's kind of a fractured relationship with various states. Arizona has a pretty decent relationship with Indian country and working together. So disability advocacy back in 1990, you know, ensuring equity and uh, full participation. Again, that's that 
self-determination that Indian country had to get a federal act for. We as well in disability culture had to get a federal act just to have self-determination. Those basic inalienable rights as a human being, we literally had to get a federal act so that we could be included. So that's kind of one of the examples of how we're related in our uh, disability and indigenous cultures uh, uh, regarding inclusion and uh, being at the table, if you will, for federal policy. So again, I'm kind of getting on the bigger picture and we'll kind of get into some of the examples of Indian country approach to disability services and employment. So this is a lot of the different tribes throughout the nation and titles and public law 280 tribes here in California. So they're not in region eight, our federal region, we're treaty tribes mostly. So again, it's a unique territories for six nations. It's a unique approach. And, uh, and this is what we're addressing for Indian country throughout the United States. Now, uh, Oklahoma, as it originally was wrote, wrote, is Indian country. If you live in Tulsa, you're a res person now. Hey, you know, so that's a new, you know, thing from the Supreme Court. 10% of all Supreme Court cases impact Indian country. So we better be involved or we'll lose our sovereignty. So here is an example of Arizona and some other states with high native populations. And what can we do working with not only our state agencies, but our employers and others that are interested in serving this larger population of people that have needs. And I wanna acknowledge my mentors, Dr. Fred McFarland and Dr. Bobby Atkins, back when I was a student in, at San Diego State and getting my master's degree in 1993 and all excited to get started. And it, it was great to be able to start with tribal vote rehab because they are truly empowerment based because ultimately they're gonna respect the culture and who we are as indigenous people, but we're also gonna gain those skills so that we can work in the Indian world as well as the non-Indian world, regardless of our disabilities. So RCDI, Rehab Cultural Diversity Initiative is what hired me right after my master's degree in 1993. So it's been a wonderful 30 years of work in the disability community. And some of those creative employment outcomes from Trouble VR is obviously our arts, you know, we are always buying our native bling, as my wife likes to say, uh, in terms of the jewelry and arts that we have. I have a lot of art in my home back here from Trouble VR artists that I try to support when I visit, because I've been to over 50 Trouble VR programs personally and have seen their work. And here's in Alaska where they're uh, doing some work on whale hides. So obviously that wouldn't be happening in Navajo country, for instance. So this is a, these are the creative, unique employment um, perspectives. And when I was in Alaska at Bristol Bay, we went to Togiak Village and suddenly we're loading supplies. They go, oh, you're going to Togiak. Do you mind taking some supplies for us? So there was some unique experience and outreach. And then some of the VR closures that were in Togiak Village that you could only access by plane or boat. There are no roads there. So it was cool to see the video store that was a voc rehab closure, the laundry mat that was a voc rehab closure, even a shower facility so that folks could take showers and not use the river to bathe was a voc rehab closure. So those are creative approaches to employment when we're working with often rural communities like Navajo. So again, these are different approaches to disability employment. Uh, here's me back when I was a youngster, <laughs> uh, over at three affiliated Voc Rehab, and they just got their first office with a ramp. So that was big for their tribe in those days in the 90s to get a ramp. And another closure of someone doing some beating and some of our native bling. Uh, back in the day, here's another historical shot of Pet Air students. These are all Voc Rehab counselors and directors that earned their certificates, and many of them went on to earn their master's degrees in rehabilitation voc rehab. So again, that's another form of them now having another uh, tool in their toolbox through academia of indigenous approach to employment. So I'm very proud of that. We need to be advocates. Here's me and Treva back in the day. Uh, I remember this was in Mississippi Choctaw. And one of the people there says, hey, do you all still live in igloos up there in Alaska? Because we had an Alaska native present. So again, we're growing still in awareness and how we can work together 
And uh, I will stop there and stop and share. And then uh, at this point, I would like to introduce our uh, partners at the National Center for American Indian Economic Development. I've worked with these folks on and off over the years, and Yvette and I even went to rival high schools in Tempe, Arizona. So uh, Yvette, if you wouldn't mind introducing the center so folks know what you do, and then Amber can take over on her approach to disability employment. And, Absolutely. Uh, Thank you, Jim. Uh, like Jim mentioned, my name is Yvette Fielder, and I'm a program director here at the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development. We're a 54 plus uh, year old nonprofit organization with our main office in Mesa, Arizona, and nine other offices across the United States. We primarily focus on business and economic development for tribal enterprises, organizations, and individual small business owners. Uh, over the course of 50 years, we've done a lot of things. We started in Los Angeles in the 80s, moved to the Mesa office. I actually have an electrician in here in my office, uh, and we have an electrical issue going on. So he's up on a ladder uh, fixing something. So if you hear some noise in the background. Um, Amber on our team is a business development specialist, and she has worked here at the National Center for the last four years. And I believe she is going to share her story with you uh, here in a minute. Um, but the National Center is proud to uh, partner with many organizations over the 50 plus years. And we're just really excited to have Amber a part of our team. Um, we put on many trainings across the United States called the Native Edge Institutes. So it's a uh, pack up and go and take our operation on the road to provide these trainings with about 50 people joining us on site and another 100 plus joining via webinars. Um, we also have our large event called the Reservation Economic Summit in Las Vegas. And through all of that, Amber has uh, mastered uh, and pivoted and weaved her way through all of these obstacles. Um, she has a heart of gold and she is just a uh, a typical native woman who doesn't give up and continues to march on despite any type of obstacle. She says she's handy capable, uh, often doesn't park in the handicapped parking lots. And I said, well, give me your decal. But now after I heard Jim's story, I wouldn't want that ever to happen to me. I just tease her though. Uh, she's She's got a great personality and she is just full of energy. And so I'm really happy to introduce Amber. I have another call, unfortunately, that I have to get on. And uh, you're in good hands with Amber. And I uh, wish I could hear the story, but I know her story. And so sit back and be be amazed so she's a wonderful lady thank you thank you jim good to see you uh, thank you so much Rogers. hey <laughs> go buffaloes hey that's our high schools but uh thanks we'll you, you guys. keep, thanks keep up the great work for indian country Palomia. thank, thank you, you. bye-bye hey amber you are on and just real quick amber and i crossed paths uh, at one of their events and then we found out that we have uh, similar tribal affiliations and we just became friends and we've been strategizing to work more together to create some uh, new programs for Indian country. So I'm very excited to have Amber join us. So Palami Asis, thank you so much for joining us. Amber. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Yvette, for that great welcome. Um, Yvette is actually my supervisor here um, and she has been a very active supporter in all the years she's trained me a lot and so i i really enjoy working for her and i think with employment in in creative strategies for employment having a supportive um supervisor really helps in in the work that um you do and what i do but just to introduce myself i am the business development specialist for the national center um, I'm an enrolled member of the Thahan Alatham Nation here in Arizona. Um, I grew up in Ajo, Arizona, um, and, and I, I'd like to start off, I, I'm glad Jim brought up working with the youth because I want to start off with a, a little story. I was a recreation manager for Hill River Indian Community, and we were doing a summer program and I used to manage a wellness center and it was the first day of the summer program for the youth there. 
And I had a, a little boy who he just made the age mark to attend the summer program. And so we were getting ready to start um, dodgeball and we're playing dodgeball. And this little kid, he goes and he tugs on my shirt. And I said, yeah, what do you need? And he said, I have a burrito in my pocket. Can I eat it? And I wasn't sure I heard correctly. And I asked him, I said, what did you say? And he said, I have a burrito in my pocket. Can I eat it? And I said, you have a burrito in your pocket. And he was, he was a short, chubby little kid in his short, he was wearing shorts that went all the way down to his ankles. And he reached in his pocket, deep into his pocket, and he pulled out a, what was a, a Lowe's ad, the home improvement store Lowe's ad. And it was like, three folds and he opened it up and he sure did have a burrito in his pocket and and he wanted to eat it and that whole summer that kid was like my favorite I was putty in his hands the whole summer but and I think that's when I realized I really enjoy the work that I do and um I I graduated from Arizona State with a degree in recreation and tourism management so um, going into that field, I think it just kind of chose me um, in taking that path. And so working with kids has always been a passion of mine. And going into that field, we learned a lot. A lot of my courses centered ar around inclusion and you, being able to include the youth, our elders, the the community has always been a passion of mine so I just kind of like to tell that story because I think working with the youth and the our elders had really geared me towards um towards my whole career in recreation tourism and now business and so being here at the national center now um after I've worked as a recreation manager for Gila River Indian Community for about 10 years, but I'd always wanted to work for, for my community. So when the Thahana Otham uh, Nation decided to open a casino in Glendale, Arizona, um, I applied for a promotions coordinator job there, which I got. So I served about four years at um, Desert Diamond Casino in Glendale. And I really, I enjoyed the job, but I missed working for a tribal community. And I was there for about four years. And one day I, I got sick at work. I was sick and I went to the hospital and I ended up, I had a, um, a flesh eating bacteria in the back of my leg. So I ended up being, I ended up getting enrolled in, um, I was in intensive care and I went through about 14 surgeries on my leg, on my left leg. And it took me about a year to recover from that. I was out of work for a year. So I ended up resigning from the casino, um, not knowing if I would ever be able to go back. I, um, getting, doing the rehab and everything. I, I was out of work for about a year and I didn't go back to work. But after that year, after all my rehabilitation, I was ready to go back to work. And that's when I applied for the job here at the National Center as a business development specialist. And it's been such a great job because I wasn't just able to work with um, the tribal community here in Arizona because we're a national organization. I was able, I've been able to work with um, tribal members all over the US. And so what I do as the business development specialist, either, either um, entrepreneurs contact me or after the NEIs, I reach out to them but I've been helping a lot of them with their business planning and just helping 
various tribal communities, tribal entrepreneurs with resources, whether it's access to capital, um, creating their business plan, um, starting it, um, government contracting, those are the topics that we cover at our NEIs. And so to, to talk about creative employment strategies for us with disabilities, I, um, I'd like to reach out and let everybody know, uh, you know, having to deal with the disability, um, you know, ever since I had my, my, my surgeries on my legs, um, two years ago during COVID, when we were at home, I had an accident which resulted in an amputated leg. So that same leg that I had um, my, my surgeries on, I lost it below the knee. Um, a year ago, I got sick again. And this time I found out it was my kidney. So now I just finished going through um, treatments for my kidneys. I go to dialysis. Um, two days out of the three days out of the week. Um, and I am now on the kidney transplant and I still work a full-time job um, juggling all of that. And I think that it's, it's because of this. I've had, I've been very fortunate to have support through my family. I've had I've been very fortunate to have support through my employment. The National Center has been a great support um, to me, um, allowing me to schedule my time um, during my treatments, during any hospitalizations and things like that. So I consider myself very fortunate. And, and I think with creative employment strategies, I just kind of had to realize that um, being being handicapped is my new is my new reality. So I really turned to that support system of my family, my friends, my coworkers. Um, and I think that what I can say about being a business development specialist and someone who is handicapped, it's just to to you know know your support system and this is your new reality and really think about what your skills are. Um, this past weekend, I did a, a beating class with my sister. And it, what I learned, what I, my takeaway from that was that the instructor in there, she talked about when she started beating and she enjoyed it so much, she was great at it. And she went to her local casino and she she went to their gift shop. She had all of these beaded earrings that she'd done and she sold it to them. And that's how she started her business as an entrepreneur doing beading and beading projects. And now that she's older, she does it. She teaches, she teaches that. And so it's a great way to earn a business. And so some of our, our handicapped people out there, if you, you know, you have a skill, know your skill, what your skill is and learn to make a business out of it. And there's go and network with different organizations. Um, you know, I'm trying to think about once I go through, through a kidney surgery, am I going to be able to work full time? And so I think about that now and, well, what are my skills? Well, I, you know, I'm in recreation, I'm in business planning, I'm in festivals and events. And so I network myself with um, associations that, that do festival, that do events, that do recreation. And I almost feel that because my background is in, in recreation and I've been taught on inclusion and I work in Indian country. I feel like that was my purpose after, after going through a disability, that my purpose is to be an advocate now for Indian country in the areas of recreation, tourism, festivals, and events. Um, you know, it's, there's so many resources out there to become an entrepreneur. 
you can go onto the SBA website and they have a laundry list of how to go through your business, thinking about your business, how to write a business plan, how to get your access to capital. There's, there are so many free resources there and you can either contact me here at the National Center. Um, you can look at our website, www.ncaied.org or you can reach out directly to me at amber, A-M-B-E-R, at ncaied.org. I'd love to help you, those of you in Indian country looking to aspire to be an entrepreneur. And that's my that's my story. And that's my that's my recommendation for creative employment in disabilities in Indian country. And I want to thank Jim again. I want to thank the Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities for allowing me to share my story with you and reach out to me. Hmm. Ah, Palamia says, thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate your story and your example of empowerment. Again, I love that word. That's why I named it empowerment, indigenous empowerment, so that we could create this circle of partners and address some of those things that you discussed and some of your challenges and your resilience as a strong native res indigenous woman, you know? So yes, there you go. <laughs> so again, that's what, uh, uh, these are the stories that we need because there's so many frustrations that we have in Indian country and disabilities and employment issues. And, but it's we're us in these uh, different areas doing our part to work together to increase those. So thank you so much, Amber. And um, again, we're gonna do a kind of a talking circle at the end, but if you have any uh, questions for Amber, please uh, ask. And then maybe Amber, if you could share your contact and web address and things of that nature so okay. that we can continue to grow our partners, not only for your organization, but for us. But Amber and I have been dreaming all along that we're gonna have some sort of uh, economic development disability component within her organization working with us so you know, look for that in the future we'll be doing something together so thank you for your time member at this point i would like to introduce and we'll transition right from to another res to salt river uh so this is our voc rehab uh portion and again uh, vocational rehab i've been working with for 30 years and uh, it's a great honor to be able to have friends in the business. And Mel and I have been buddies for many, many years. And uh, seeing some of the changes and those frustrations on national levels, but we keep doing what we can to get around those barriers and create opportunities for Indian country. And Mel and her team do a great job, not only in Salt River, but in the urban Phoenix area as well because of their proximity to the city and trying to get more businesses structured on the res as well. So she works with a variety of different labor, education, uh, different programs to create some of these uh, employment opportunities. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Melanie Murray from Salt River Voc Rehab. So Palami assist for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. So um, as, as he mentioned, I am Melanie Murray. I'm the vocational services manager here in Salt River. Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community. Um, I oversee Voc Rehab. Uh, we've been operating for 11 years doing Voc Rehab here in Salt River. And I also oversee a career counseling program um, for individual, all individuals, not just those with, with a disability. A um, little bit of background, if you don't know a lot about Salt River or nowhere, I, th I think majority probably know basically where we're, we're located. We are in the Phoenix metro area. And Jimmy mentioned it and that, that does present um, a lot of opportunity for, for our members who are looking for employment. Um, so just kind of to frame your, you know, your thought process in it, a lot of times when people are thinking of tribal voc rehab, they're thinking rural areas. Um, we, are, we are not that. Uh, we are one of six tribal communities in Arizona with the tribal voc rehab program. Um, the other communities, we all um, communicate with each other, work with each other. In fact, the foundation of our program is was built because of other programs within the, the state of Arizona providing, as well as Jimmy provided some mentorship um, back in 2011 and 2012, whenever we, we began building this program. 
Um, we have been prov providing services since 2012. Uh, we began in 2011, but didn't open the doors for service provision until 2012. Um, the, the community is around 11,000 members. Um, about 6,000 live here in the community on, on the res. Um, of that, we've, we've provided service to about 1,000 um, different cases over the course of the 11 years a couple of repeat offenders as well. Um, of those thousand, we, we can boast about 300 what in the voc rehab world we call a successful closure, um, which is, we're around the 30, 35% successful closure rate. Um, I like to talk about that because when I first started, I really felt like every person that came through was gonna make some kind of gain, whether it was a successful closure or not a successful closure. If they made a step in the right direction or or got better for the next time they came back with us, um, then I counted that as a successful closure. But this number that I shared, the 300, is the actual um, closure that that the uh, Department of Ed and and RSA measures us by. So, of the thousand we've served, we've had a lot more successes than 300. But 300 have gained that employment um, for the 90 plus days and. and um, we're really proud of that number. We, it's, it's even though we are in a metro area, we have a lot of uh, other barriers, and, and each individual has their own barriers. Um, but we also have many opportunities, and I kind of want to talk about my opportunities here, the partnerships here, uh, and then talk about why it's worked because we've been pretty successful um, from starting from you know absolutely nothing to where we've come in, in the 11 years. So the opportunities. Obviously, I mentioned we're in the metro area of Phoenix, you know, millions of people, millions of, of jobs. But we also, in the Salt River uh, government, we have over 2,000 government jobs. So the, the community government's very large. Um, majority of our consumers, our clients that come through, that is their goal. They want to work for their, their community. Um, in addition to the tribal government jobs, we've got two casinos, um, and one of them has a resort. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities there, which is another piece of, you know, the mindset of oh, I want to work in my community. Well, that is just considered there as well. Um, we have hundreds of, of job opportunities in the community boundaries because of our location. We have enterprises of the community. We also have businesses that are located on tribal land. Um, so there's a many, many opportunities in terms of employment. So it's not similar to it to majority of other tribal voc rehabs in that regard. Um, there are the employment opportunities out there. Um, the other thing that, that's a, a huge um, plus for us here in Salt River is we have a lot of partnerships, a lot of programs that support the community members. Um, we, we have the workforce programs, which uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of communities have the WIOA program. We also have a very successful apprenticeship program uh, there's an internship program here in the community. There's a temp jobs. We also have um, a, a day work program. These are all underneath uh, a branch of HR they call community employment. In the community employment, we partner with, with those programs so that they're, the individuals who come through voc rehab who have that documented disability, have the need for VR services, we utilize all the other services, try to partner um, to provide that wraparound for the individuals. Um, we also have a um, really good relationship with our HHS department, uh, or we've got all different um, programs under that, but one of the things that we found very successful for us is uh, identifying uh, individuals who maybe need further evaluation, further support so that they can be properly um, accommodated in a workplace, and HHS has provided a lot of, of that type of evaluation services for us. Um, and then we have a pretty comprehensive um, partnership with the education department, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit because I'll, I'm going to talk about transition services, which is one of the um, objectives within our grant. Um, so why is it work? This is, you know, the, the topic is creative employment um, strategies or I feel like in Salt River, I feel like we're not real creative. I, I, we're just providing that one-on-one -on -one support. And this is the reason that, that um, there are now two programs 
underneath my, my division is because of the success of the Voc Rehab program. The success there is the one-on-one -on -one support. Guidance and counseling is the key. Anyone who knows anything about Voc Rehab, you know that having a good VR counselor can mean all the difference in the world. Um, or having, if, even if it's not a VR counselor, just someone who's managing your case or providing you some kind of guidance in the right direction. Um, almost all the staff uh, on my team are here from the community. That's a, a big plus, I believe, as well. Um, knowing the community, knowing the history, knowing the people, it's really been a very uh, successful piece for us. Um, we do have a, a key, and this is, this is VR everywhere, should be VR everywhere that you're focusing on their strengths, their abilities, their interests, ways that they can come over, overcome those barriers that are related to their disability or their di diagnosis. Um, you know, and I think Amber mentioned that, what, what do I have? What, what are my skills? That's really the, the key to what we've been able to do here in Salt River is pull out the things that, yes, you're good at this and you wanna do this. How can we find that to come together? Um, identifying those limitations, whatever they may be, related to the disability um, and finding ways to, to overcome those, those barriers. Um, one of the keys to, to what we train our VR counselors and what, what we've worked with the youth on is managing their disability. So how do you cope? How, do you, how, how are you taking care of yourself? All of those important things and understanding exactly what your disability is, how is it impacting you and what kind of things you can do um, to help yourself. Um, and what, what kind of things can you set up structurally, those types of things. In, within uh, our program, we've had multiple small business um, entrepreneurs. We've had um, different types of, I thought when I first started this job, I was gonna have a lot of like, a lot of artists. I thought there would be some of that. Really, it's been an interesting piece. Our very first uh, entrepreneur was someone who was a cosmetologist. So that was a cool thing to, to see develop over time. We've had someone run a uh, screen printing business, um, some uh, unique auto body um, employment opportunities. Um, we've had a mechanic, we've had a bunch of different types of, of small business um, individuals who wanna be entrepreneurs. And um, I think somebody put in the chat box that there is a self-employment program. There's um, there's a bunch of different opportunities for, for um, self-employment in the TVR world as well. Um, that's been helpful for us. Um, and then the last piece of our, um, the, our programming is uh, transition services. And I know someone else is gonna meant to talk about that, um, but that is one of, the, one of the reasons they even wrote a grant or applied for a grant here in Salt River for tribal voc rehab was because for many years there was talk about youth with disabilities not being able to go into the workforce when they were done with school. And that was well documented. Um, they did write the grant, this was funded. So that was one of the pieces, um, one of the important pieces I felt like we should always keep in the grant as long as it's a need um, was transition services. So services to our youth in the community with disabilities or diagnosis that are, are disabling to them. Um, it, it's an objective that's been outlined in every grant that we've had. We're on our third grant cycle. Um, we, ha we have a school here located in the community. Um, we, we, we have provided direct transition services to them, to the students with IEPs and 504s in the, in the Salt River schools. The school has um, changed a bit since we started. Um, many of the kids have gone to, to surrounding schools, Mesa Public Schools, Scottsdale Schools. So those students are still receiving the information. It's more of an indirect format, but the direct format that we have uh, over the course of 10 years provided the transition services to the youth in the community, um, addressing all of those needs, uh, you know, post-secondary education, employment, independent living, um, access to adult services, community participation, all of those types of things. Um, we put together, we created a, not like rocket science or anything, but, but we created a, a portfolio for the youth. We found that a lot of them didn't have those important documents that you might need um, as you're moving on into the employment world. And we 
tried to help them organize how you how do you go about getting them if you do not have them um and then how do you keep track of that stuff and what are you going to need where, where where are the resources um so we put together a small i call it curriculum with air with air quotes um i really kind of I used to teach a job class whenever I was a teacher in New Mexico, and we used that that curriculum for this, and we just added in the disability piece so that they would have their their diagnostics so that if they were going to college, they would be able to you know access the disability resources properly um, or if they were going to be going to the voc rehab world, they would have that that their proper diagnostics to be able to look at um, eligibility criteria there. We've been very successful in, in um, reaching out to those youth in the last, you know, 10 years, and many of the youth have come through as um, adult clients. So that's been, I think, a positive because they already kind of know, okay, this is where I'm going to go. Um, something, some other things that have been really interesting here in the community because it is 2000, the government itself, 2000 employees, um, I don't know, probably 15 departments. I don't even know how many departments there are. There's so many. Um, we have been able to have people placed in positions as we partner with our, our workforce partners and have you know work experience opportunities on the job training. And we've been able to make connections with the, the supervisors, with the departments. And I think that's one of the keys, something that I think kind of like stands out to us is if you can make a, a, a connection and, and get you know, the foot in the door and, and be able to show them, hey, this is a good fit for for our person. This is a good fit for your department. Um, those very careful placements um, and you're setting your person, your individual, your your consumer up to, up for success if you do that. Um, and we were able, we've been able to work in, in 11 different departments here in the community and, and provided, uh, you know, jointly work experience opportunities that have led to temporary employment, which have, would lead to eventually permanent employment. And some of the, back to the beginning part where we're talking about how do you do it, you finding their skills, finding what they're good at, what they're interested in, what what they're, they're gonna be the best match for them. I think that's really the key to this creative part is the individual and, and you know, we sit in our orientations and everybody hears the word individualized over and over. Um, it sounds like it's overused, but it really is. And I think VR, the beauty of VR is that if you if you look at one person's plan that's in VR, it's very unique. You won't you aren't going to find two plans that are the same. And, and I think it's the same with people. You're not going to find two people that needs and their skills are going to be the same. So that's the the cool part is we're able to kind of adapt, move around, and change things so that the individual their limitations and their their barriers are addressed by whatever services they may need and the, the support that we give them. Um, and I, I think the, the, the difference for us, and there are a lot of other um, communities that are in areas similar to Salt River, and we have similar things where there's all these, all these opportunities, but there's still barriers. And, and that's the piece where VR, I encourage people to reach out and find VR, even if you're you're not able to find a tribal VR, to find the state VR um, to, to provide those services if they're needed, because that can mean a difference for somebody who otherwise wouldn't keep that job or get that job, whatever it is. Um, and we've had a lot of opportunity or a lot of um, success working with the last piece I want to touch on is the um, post-secondary ed, not a lot of our VR clientele have, have accessed a lot of post-secondary education, but those that have, we've had very good working relationships with the disability resource services and also the, uh, some of them call them accessibility services. Um, because what, what happens is that the more support the individual has, the more likely they're going to be to be able to to get over some of those barriers that they may have. We've had individuals who have also uh, needed further evaluations, that kind of thing I mentioned earlier, but in order to be able to get an accommodation to a GED or whatever it may be, be, may be for them, but they, they really um, 
the, the key to it is that individual person being able to connect with someone. And I think reaching out, um, giving information, it feels like we're always doing outreach and giving information. Um, making those connections is, is really what makes it successful for the individual. And I think that's really, I mean, I don't know if there were other things that, that you wanted to hear about Salt River, but in terms of VR, that's really the, the synopsis of it all. Does, does anybody have anything or do you want to wait to the end, Jimmy? Oh, if there's questions now, I feel more than free to ask them and then we can move on to Eric. But Mel, just before any questions come in, thank you so much for that model of success and working with your community and the unique issues that you have because it's uh you have rural communities right in the middle of uh, metropolitan phoenix so it's an interesting dynamic yeah. to have the there's still dirt roads on the road oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> so i remember as a kid i used to swim in the canals there with my uh, pima buddies over there so uh uh any questions for melanie regarding uh self-employment uh, oh someone on the chat mentioned self-employment and RSA services. And that's a big one for Trouble VR because often our communities don't have employment available. And then here we are as an employment program trying to convince people to get off their, uh, you know, their uh, SSA or SSDI support. Mm -hmm. And then we're going, here, here we are, we can get you a job and you can give up those, uh, <laughs> those services from uh, SSA. And it's a, it's a hard sell sometimes in some of our communities. So again, that's the empowerment model and developing, you know, those employment opportunities. Self-employment is awesome. Uh, for instance, at White Mountain Apache, one of their outcomes was a mobile Chinese food truck. And there was no Chinese food on the res. So he was parked in the Bash's parking lot. I ate there a couple of times. And, uh, you know, so that, that was a successful business where he had to hire two more voc rehab consumers to join his team because he was his business was growing and there's so many of those examples that we'll discuss as well but any questions or anything before we uh move on thank you again mel oh betty uh yes thanks mel for the history and uh, the approach that you're utilizing in your community so uh folks appreciate your message and we'll do a little q a uh, mini talking circle uh at the end of our uh, presentation today so that we can ensure your involved as well as participants. So thank you, Mel. We really appreciate the work you do in Salt River. So uh, we'll be back with you then, Amber, when we have our uh, mini talking circle. So thank you so much. And my new buddy, Eric. Hey, good to see you from Hangar. And this is a national organization. Well, it seems national. There's one in Rapid City that I'm hoping to do in partnership with Oyate Circle and some of our advocacy and leadership work that we do in developing some of these partnerships with employers and businesses that want to work in Indian country. And Eric and I are strategizing and putting our strategy together <laughs> in order to develop a, an on-res fabrication lab for prosthetics. And my dream someday is to have res-proof wheelchairs and prosthetics that allow people to get around territories that may not have sidewalks and curb cuts and the such, but need to deal with some of those dirt roads and access issues on the res. So we're hoping for res proof prosthetics in the future, as well as wheelchairs. And uh, we almost got that Kellogg grant, that was close. That would have been wonderful, but yeah. <laughs> but they actually said it's too big of an issue. So, you know, that's frustrating when funding agencies see that, you know what, the need is too big, let's get an easier approach. And that's, you know, that's frustrating to have that kind of peer review from folks that are not necessarily peers of Indian country. So it's great to have a new peer and ally with Eric Burns over at Hangar. So if you could please share your perspectives on well, employment for Indian country. Well, well thank you, Jim, that's really kind words. But before we start, I think I wanted to, to, to celebrate your, your passion and love for what we're doing because, you know, the reality is there are a lot of big problems in the world, and the way you solve them is one step at a time. It's like anything. You, 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 the, the step of a million, a hundred miles, a thousand miles starts with one step. And I think that's what we've been working on for years now. We're, we're making steps forward, and I'm really excited about some of the possibilities. Um, I am from a company, and I am, and we let me talk a little bit about who we are, what we do, and kind of what some of the gyms and our, uh, strategy and our vision, what it could be. Because it's really, really uh, exciting. Jim started the, the call this morning about 
empowering uh, natives and empowering people. Our, our, our corporate motto is actually empowering human potential. And, and what we do as an organization is we provide orthotic and prosthetic care. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's an orthopedic brace, a support, a, uh, a brace to help your foot or your leg, or a spinal brace or back brace, or a prosthetic for your arms or legs to allow you to return to independence. And so we're the largest provider in the world of, of these devices. Um, and when you look at us trying to help empower human potential, uh, the native culture is, is unfortunately does have a very high incidence of, of diabetes, has a very high incidence of amputation, and uh, one of the highest ethnicities in the world. Um, and so if we want to empower human potential, there's no ignoring the needs and, and, and underserved communities in the native population. And so my hope would be that as a, as to, to help better serve is there's nothing more important than having a, a, a native serve a native. And what we're talking about is I'd love for every prosthetic made for a Native American to be made by a Native American. I'd love for the care to be provided by a Native American. And so what we've been working on the last few years is how do we get care to the, to the nation, different nations and how do we get it by a familiar face or an ally or a native providing for a native? So we're working on several strategies to do that around the state and around the country. And, and we have different levels. So when you think of, well, I can't make something, well, we, we can train you. So we actually have a pilot program currently in Phoenix to hire, uh, to hire people in our, our lab in Phoenix. And it's to, well, we don't have it to have experience. You have, you, all you have to do is be able to have some hand skills. We'll train and develop you. And you'll be making anything from simple devices to very high complex devices, depending on where your, your skill sets take you. You could be working with 3D printers and doing computer design, or you could be just working with your hands doing leather work. There's just so many different uh, areas to work on the fabrication side. And if you're, if you're a person who's not really uh, into fabrication, we have roles in clinics. And our, one of the one things that we're piloting right now is we have several Native Americans we've hired in the front office that are greeting and processing the work to get it done through, through, through different payers. We have people who are developing to be clinicians. I, I met a, a wonderful lady, uh, the great story. I was up at a, a, a sheep herding a conference in outside in Shiprock uh, about a month ago. And I met a, a medicine man named uh, Wilson DeVore and his, his wife, uh, sister works with us, and she's and she was up with in uh, in uh, Winslow with the new Native American Center up there. And our goal is to get her up on the on the reservation, working, treating patients, taking care of them with their diabetes and their shoes, um, and also start establishing care. So if you want to actually help, there's clinical pathways to develop you that way. If you want to be in the, in the front, you want to fabricate, or you just want to be an assistant. We're looking at many pathways because I think the best way we could we could serve. Uh, the native culture is to have natives providing that care. So I would like to be able to, to provide not, not only the care, but economic opportunities and jobs and provide that care and have that work done and made by a native. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. And, and what we're trying to do is open clinics and open facilities that can serve uh, native people on, on the reservations. So that's kind of our vision and our goal. And so um, we do have, our clinics are small. So most clinics have two or three people in them. Um, as we're working, we've been at, working at Cells Medical Hospital for the last 25 years. We go there weekly. We've done clinics there. We were, were out there all the time. We're also in the Pasca uh, Medical Center. Um, and so we're looking to expand that care and expand those models with Native Americans. And so um, I can give you some flyer information. My contact information is on here. So please reach out to me. And I'd love to look for any kind of opportunity we can to kind of bring more and more natives uh, employment opportunities to take care of disabled uh, uh, people on the reservation. So that's kind of our story, our goal, and our dream. And I hope to be talking a lot more about this as we get more and more resources and more and more vision. Uh, one of the, the goals that Jim and I have talked about is we'd love to get someone that can help develop and, and, and come like a guidance counselor to help bring on uh, more Native Americans to help train them and find them the role where they're happy because the work we do is very rewarding. It does empower the, our patients and everyone we get to see, but also it can really help uh, our underserved uh, Native population. And that's that's our ultimate goal. Mm. I, I talk fast for the to challenge the, the transcriber, but um, I, I get excited and, and passionate about what we're trying to do here. So I talk fast. Um, <laughs> Any questions? Thank you so much, Eric. Yes, and we really appreciate your commitment to make something happen for Indian country. And I'm excited to do these satellite uh, fabrication labs 
which hopefully we can partner with our various tribal nations, voc rehab programs, whatever, in order to uh, create those labs on the res. And wouldn't it be wonderful to see a variety of individuals with disabilities creating those res proof prosthetics that I'm dreaming of someday. So Amber, we may have to have you uh, try some prosthetics out and cruise around the res and uh, let us know if they're working down the line as we continue dreaming. And that's what I want is all of us need to keep dreaming and think of the big picture. We have those frustrations and barriers, but we cannot allow those to stop our progress. There's barriers, of course, to starting businesses on the res, and Eric and I are facing some of those challenges, but we're going to do it one way or the other. And I'm excited that Hangar has an office in Rapid City, South Dakota, so that we can create something on my res in Pine Ridge, I hope someday, uh, working with through the Oyate Circle and our partners there. So again, uh, I really appreciate this group here for presenting, and I want to share my screen and just share what we uh, uh, witnessed at Hangar. Uh, this is Joshua, and he is, what's his title, Eric? I'm sorry, he's one of the supervisors, right? Yeah, he's a supervisor of the, of the technician floor, so he runs the floor. Oh, wonderful, and he happens to be from Cherokee Nation. So uh, our Joshua at uh, Circle of Indigenous Empowerment met him, so we had two Joshes working together, and it's good to see our young tribal members working together. I don't know if they see themselves as young, but as an elder in training, I see them as young men, and uh, they're going to make some good things happen. When Eric, when you and I are limping off into sunsets that happen, they're, they're going to keep going, and that's part Absolutely. of that empowerment. Yes, Eric. <laughs> Absolutely, and I also think if you look at this picture, it's a great picture. This is this is a model of success. He is a Native American. He's also an amputee. He's also uh, providing job opportunities, and he's very passionate about getting uh, uh, natives on, in, the, in the facility to get jobs and, and help create this. So um, he's a model of success that we want to duplicate over and over and over again. Yeah. And here's just some more pictures of the fabrication lab, the main headquarters, I guess, in terms of making the prosthetics. These are baby helmets that are made. And... Uh, as I recall, you're making over 50 baby helmets a day, as well as over 70 leg prosthetics a day. Am I correct, Eric? Correct. Yes. So that's obvious. And you're backlogged. You, yeah, yeah. So right now, with uh, having some delays and getting our on-res fabrication lab, we're going to create a native cohort of native workers that will work in the main office in Phoenix. So that's something we're creating, and I hope some of the folks here and your organizations may have some uh, ideas of individuals that may need that employment opportunity. And I always say that it can be any Native person because they may have a disability without identifying, because there's so much of those disabilities involved with the trauma and post-traumatic stress and some of those issues that I have as a Native person. I'm just fortunate that I can manifest it in a good way and uh, doing this kind of work to make me feel that I'm doing something for the people, the Oyate. So this was a good day that we had, and it's uh, these uh, little building these helmets for the kids, and they get the uh, computer. There's our Joshua, by the way, right there. Uh, so he's uh, working with our, um, our youth transition program, and I think he may be joining here shortly. Uh, he's working with our national contact with Department of Labor right now, creating more programs, empowerment. So this was just a good day of seeing these type of uh, things happening and the baby. Uh, oh, well, let's see if this works. So that's some baby out there in America that got their head measured so that this helmet can fit them appropriately. I would love to see this on the res. And that's what Eric and I are dreaming about so that we hopefully will get something like this so that we can uh, emulate many fabrications labs on different reservations throughout the nation. And there's four leg and just amazing work that they do. And so I'm hoping that we are able to uh, uh, live that dream, but we're going to make it happen with a native cohort so that we can get started now with any folks that are interested in working in this field of prosthetics. So let me uh, get to the rest of my PowerPoint and then we can uh, close out with our talking circle. <clears throat> when you think of disability, what are your perspectives? Think of how you see it as an individual, how you were taught as an individual, the disability or the handicap or 
what uh, whatever it may be, you know, we try to use uh, people first language. And here's people first, my pops. And to my, I know I'm working with the cats at U of A, but I'm a sun devil. Hey, <laughs> so here's my dad and I after one of my games. And it was awesome to have a wheelchair section of fans that I could look, look up to in the stands and always see my dad there. And as I shared that story, here's a newspaper article in 1979 where he, you know, was addressing some of those challenges that I shared with you earlier. So again, this is the strongest man I knew. And uh, he lived with MS for 37 years and was a great advocate. And he was uh, here long enough to see ADA pass. So that is wonderful. I think I have a book here, Rolling Warrior in my background here, honoring Judith Human and the empowerment that she represented when we were getting uh, Americans with Disabilities Act passed. So uh, pretend in your language, disability, there's no word for disability in our languages. So how do we kind of address this term in a traditional format? That's why we have our program called Finds Their Way for our youth transition. You know, that's why it's uh, indigenous empowerment and not a disability center, you know? So again, it's something that we want to have that civil right and of course, civil rights back in 1964 forgot two cultures, the native culture and the disability culture. So we have had, as a result, had to do federal acts to address being left out of some of that civil rights. And now we have ADA. So this is something that empowers people with disabilities. Like my dad was fired by the state of Arizona because of his disability. But I remember that day when he had our family meeting. And that, and as a grandpa and a dad, now I know that had to be a hard day for him, but I didn't see it in him as a child. I didn't see his wheelchair. I saw pops. And I knew that, well, geez, you, you're going to get another job. You have skills, you know? So again, just seeing that example of strength with disability and empowerment, and he went out and got another job and became the number one salesman for red carpet realty <laughs> so you know again that's the resilience and more recently we've had this report out so now we have modern you know um, up-to-date information on disabilities so it's wonderful after 30 years seeing some of these efforts to give a national perspective of disability and health care and education and employment independent living all those elements and here's the conclusion 30 years later, we're still identifying the same challenges. Now, I don't let this get me down. It gives me energy to know that we have more work to do. So it's not gonna be a one generation thing. So I'm not gonna see it in my life, but my Takoja is my grandchildren, they. What if they end up with disabilities? I want them as not only indigenous people, but people with disabilities to have these type of things addressed. And that's what we're doing today as partners, uh, all of us, we're doing the best we can to, here we are in 2023 addressing transportation, limited federal funding, most underserved, most neglected population. You know, enforcement of disability rights is huge because there's no funding. When ADA was passed, it was an unfunded act. So unfortunately it had to be kind of formalized by case history, by lawsuits. So, but as tribal nations, we don't have to implement ADA, but many of our nations do naturally because we have a value for our elders, which often have disabilities. So with that, it spreads to our youth, our young ones with disabilities and incorporating like Pine Ridge, my res, my people, the Oyate there did an ADA. They just don't have the funds to enforce it. So again, with the Oyate Circle, this is how we started our program in Arizona. And our partners in South Dakota is the South Dakota Council on Developmental Disabilities. So they provide funding in uh, areas of advocacy and leadership, family services. And so that's one of our partners that we developed in South Dakota, along with the rehabilitation funds our alpha camps for our pre-ETS employment training services for our high school kids. So it's all about getting those allies and how can we work together because all of us as two-leggeds, as human beings, share that common bond of, we wanna make a difference for our people that happen to have disabilities. 
So when the uh, Arizona Center uh, Developmental Disabilities Planning Council heard about Oyate Circle, they said, we want an Oyate Circle. <laughs> so that was the kind of the seed that I planted to create Native Center uh, for Disabilities, which is under one of the programs under our Circle for Indigenous Empowerment. So the, again, working with our partners that want to do good things in Indian country is essential. So that's why I wanted this uh, diverse group of presenters representing Indian economic development and disability, representing tribal vocational rehabilitation, disability services, and representing a corporation, a company that happens to make prosthetics and sees the need for Indian country. So that's three examples of empowerment. So at this point, I'd like to start our mini talking circle digital. Usually I, you know, we'd be in a circle and I always like to share this story when I was a student back at uh, San Diego State in 1990, I believe this was, we went to, me and a co-student who was non-Indian, she and I did a, a project for one of our classes to do a comparative analysis of uh, AA meetings, the Alcoholic Anonymous meetings compared for non-Indians and Indian country. So we attended a non-Indian AA meeting at a hospital that was well lit in a big room and rows of people and the podium and people getting up to talk and share their story. And that was a wonderful experience because I've never been to one. Then we went to the Indian Center, the Urban Indian Center in San Diego and attended one that was in a circle and utilized our talking circle format of uh, utilizing the uh, candlelight. So the light was a little bit not as <laughs> prevalent as those bright lights. We were in the circle and passed around the sage and smudge and did our indigenous approach to Alcoholics Anonymous services. And the outcome was, was my non-Indian uh, co-student, uh, she goes, I want to do it the Indian way, you know, because she happened to be in AA herself and she was wanting to join the Indians. So she enjoyed the indigenous approach. And that happens often when we can share our tribal indigenous approaches and many of our non-Indian uh, allies and partners see the value of that. So uh, here, you don't have to speak uh, out loud, you can share in the chat, but we would really like to get your input on creative employment strategies and what you do to address some of these challenges. And uh, I think we're okay to have people share verbally, but again, this is the virtual approach, just remember the Zoom, Zoom, Zoom reality, we had to, uh, as a result of COVID, now we have, you know, a digital talking circle format as a result. And now we keep using it because we can't always get together in a circle to share. So here's our digital format. So imagine you're in a wonderful environment in a circle with allies and you feel comfortable to share and that's the energy and environment that we create for our people to share as we uh, um, discuss this group information. The, uh, this is the outcome of that where we get our data and the information to serve our communities. So again, it's uh, usually we'd be passing around a feather or a talking stick or whatever is appropriate for the community. In this case, we're going to do our hand raise uh, in the uh, um, uh, in the Zoom here. And uh, so we already have our first one. So let me stop sharing here. <clears throat> and Gail, if you could uh, share your perspectives, please. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yes, I was just thinking, uh, I would like to know the dreams and ideas of jobs and employment directions from people uh, in Indian country. I'd like to have a list or by location, what, what prompts them to want to do certain things or or do they need more? Um, do they need more um, information and resources to make those decisions? I just would like to know more about the kinds of interests and things that are developed. Would anyone like to share some of their perspectives? Obviously, services on White Mountain Apache may be different than Salt River because of geography as well as culture. It would be different on Hopi as well. Surrounded by Navajo, hey. <laughs> so again, those are some of the unique <laughs> employment realities of what is available on the res in particular. 
which is usually tribal government or grant programs. So again, that's why self-employment and voc rehab is so huge. It's much more prevalent in the tribal programs than the state programs, because often we don't have the competition that the state would have in terms of starting a business. It may be the first and only business of its kind for the community. Like I said, with the video store and the laundromat and some of these unique closures. Uh, I love Alaska with one of their closures was reindeer herder. So they're obviously addressing their culture and geographic aspect in terms of herding reindeer, which I never heard of. So again, these are some of the unique uh, aspects of Indian country. Does anyone wanna share? <clears throat> this is a safe place to share. So anything that you have in ideas or perspectives or? Well, I, hi, my name is Chris oh, McGuffin. I'm a job developer and employment specialist with La Frontera. And um, we work with a program called Arizona Stitch Lab. It does help with the uh, entrepreneurship, but it does industrial sewing. So we have a lot of upholstery. We have a lot of uh, seamstress and seamsters coming in. Um, we have Sombrella who's coming to Arizona, which is a huge uh, outdoors um, patio furniture, awnings, things like that. But Arizona Stitch Lab has, and I believe they're on a grant right now with uh, the Paco, the Paco Yaski tribe, Yaki tribe um, in Tucson, Arizona, and it's a free program. So if you guys do have anybody that's interested, they're welcome to join up and sign at that. It's Arizona Stitch Lab. Um, but they do a lot of industrial sewing to help push the entrepreneurial, but they're also having uh, job development opportunities where they're reaching out to upholstery companies such as Sombrella. Um, I think we have a couple with like Abrams where they're doing for the airliners, they're doing reupholstery for the airlining seats, things like that. Um, Arizona awning is one of them, if I didn't say that, but it's another big one that they're pushing right now that it's, it's open because for some reason, it's a population that's driven towards uh, older individuals, um, the industrial sewing, but they're using that right now. That's the one that I'm working with closely and uh, that I'm familiar with. So. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. There's another example of unique employment outcomes. And with all the visits I've done, I remember Mississippi Choctaw had a contract with four trucks and they had uh, some of their consumers building the radios components, uh, stereos for the Ford trucks, as well as Xerox. When Xerox was around, they were doing something, building components for Xerox copy machines on the res. So that was pretty cool to see there too. So, oh, another hand, Sharon, if you could please. Good afternoon. Hi, um, so this is so interesting to me because I too am, uh, handicapped, but pretty embarrassed sometimes because, you know, I know those who are out there, they feel like if you put down your, dis you have a disability, you won't get hired or they'll look at you like um, kind of in a different way. They treat you differently after they find out what it is. Um, um, mine, unfortunately, was um, domestic violence and being um, hit so many times, now I have epilepsy and I do have seizures. So, um, but that doesn't mean I'm not normal. <laughs> I still can talk and walk and I still have a good personality. I don't treat people crazy, but you know, I can. <laughs> no, just kidding. But um, just a little Indian humor, but uh, um, Sorry, I'm, my name's Sharon. I'm the HR manager for Native American Connections um, from Gila River, um, Pima. And also uh, my aunt was a former governor, um, Mary Thomas. And um, my aunt is Ramona Button. So they are with Ramona Farms. So um, I am still connected with my heritage, my culture and um, um, I know exactly what you're talking about when it comes to res living. And um, I also went to school at Santa Rosa boarding school out in TO. So um, a lot of uh, trauma and also, um, anyway, back to where I was going. I'm, I'm here as a recruiter also at um, NAC and we see a lot of um, people who want to sign up We're a second chance employer. So we try and give people second chances. And I think that should be the same for 
handicap or disability um, individuals who'd like to work here. Um, I also was thinking that maybe one day we could put together something like um, a virtual um, job fair for those who are stuck at home and maybe you get a bunch of remote employers who are looking for those. And I think that would be a great help to those who are in need. Um, not just because I'm working here. I'm not, I mean, I'm for the people. So mm -hmm. if they can't leave home, um, you don't want to just be sitting still. I'm sure they would want to work and earn an income. And I think that the way that employers are going now, they're looking for um, remote employees. So I think we could reach out to those who are looking for that and um, kind of like bridge the gap and put them together. I, I really would like to um, be a part of that if that's available and help out on my, um, just volunteer if I have to, but my, um, my main focus is to get people jobs. That's why I'm in HR, but I'd like to help my community. I'd like to help those who can't help themselves and even grow people who are looking to grow, um, who feel that they're less than, because I too feel that way, but, um, I'm getting there. I'm getting there slowly but surely with age, but um, I know those who are in my position and they don't have a voice and I'd like to be there for that. Mm. Oh, thank you. so much, Sharon, and thank you for sharing your experiences. And just to give a plug to Native Connections, Phoenix Native Connections has been a long-term program that's really done some great work for uh, Indian people. Uh, some of my family members have used it. And my mom was on the board on uh, many years ago. And Didi Yazi, your former, is she still director or did she retire? She retired. Okay. She's out of here. So, so Didi uh, <laughs> was at our house many times because uh, she's a friend of mom and asked mom to be on the board to make sure the indigenous voice was there. And uh, just for you football fans, her um, maiden name was Divine. So she, Dan Divine was uh, her dad and he was a coach in uh, Notre Dame but as well as Arizona State Sun Devils too so again Sharon thank you so much and we would love to have you as one of our partners in terms of what can we do to get more of the disability employment supports for your uh, organization but also Gila River as well because Gila River doesn't have a voc rehab program so it'd be of nice course. to create something to help support uh, your tribal members with employment Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, does anyone else have comments? I know we're getting a lot of good things here uh, on the chat. So check out the chat for more information. And all this will be archived as well. And we want to make sure that we uh, have these ideas and examples added to our database, if you will, for ideas out there. So I'm going to do what we usually don't do in talking circles in person is I'm going to call out some friends and Rachel, are you still on? Yeah, oh, hello. Hey, Rachel, she's another person of empowerment for Indian country. And uh, she's one of my former star students. And I know that she has, I would imagine some good ideas and examples of what she's doing in her community. So Rachel, if you wouldn't mind sharing a couple minutes, sorry, I'm allowed to do that as your old professor. Hey. <laughs> this is a wonderful group and I've enjoyed the discussion so far and and uh, so thank you all for being here and for um, having this webinar and talking circle. Um, one of the things that is um, I would say a little bit unique in our area currently um, we haven't had a chance to get it up and running yet because um, we started the process kind of right before COVID hit. And so we also were short staffed for a period of time. Um, and so that's one of the things on my agenda to get the ball rolling again, um, get those get those things in motion. But we have um, secured some supplies and we, we actually kind of took this idea off of another tribal VR program, um, some different ideas that had been thrown around to help with self-employment. Um, and one of the things that we see sometimes is that individuals want to be self-employed and they have certain ideas that maybe they do some things here and there on the side. They see people who do maybe some, um, you know, powwow outfits, regalia, beadwork, 
uh, sewing of shawls and a number of different things. And they see other people have good success with that. They enjoy doing it maybe for some family members here and there. They want to develop those skills further and they want to make it a business. However, sometimes um, the idea might be wonderful, but maybe with their disability or certain other aspects, they haven't quite taken into consideration the whole picture and how many hours that takes uh, in maybe the same type of position and what kind of materials are needed and the cost of um, replenishing their supplies and you know that whole business plan kind of thing. Um, but also physically, if they're going to be able to keep up with that as an actual business. So one of the things that we um, started to develop is kind of a self-employment training slash um, kind of a practice session is what we're working on, where we have secured some different materials, some sewing machines, um, a lot of different supplies for our VR program, where we're going to allow people to hopefully sit down with somebody that can help them. Um, maybe if they're not familiar with the actual techniques that we would bring in some trainers, some, some experts, in the community that already are doing this, um, you know, full time or or they have many years experience and helping them to develop those skills, but also letting them do it for a period of time and see if it's going to work out for them long term rather than invest for that individual a whole bunch of equipment and then it not work out for them. So in this way, they're going to be able to come and test it out, see if that's really what they want to focus their time and energy on, and then. If not, then it can it can be kind of a, t a test period before we actually have them try to develop that as their own company, basically. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do that's different than what we've done in the past. Uh, Rachel, would you mind sharing your contact information just uh, so that folks know where you're from? Oh, just real quick, share where you're from and your tribal voc rehab. I'm sorry, I did not introduce myself. I am with Delaware Nation Vocational Rehabilitation. We're located in Oklahoma and similar to Melanie's um, area, we are unique in the sense that we do have a metro area that we encompass. Um, the eight counties that we serve, a few of those are right in the Oklahoma City area, but then we also have some very rural areas. Delaware Nation is headquartered in Anadarko, Oklahoma, along with some other um, tribes that have tribal VR programs as well, the Wichita's and affiliated tribes, the Apache tribe of Oklahoma, and then the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma also goes up into that county as their service area. Um, and so we have some very rural areas and we have quite a few tribes that we serve, which is another unique aspect of our program. Um, there are 10 tribal VRs in Oklahoma and there are 38 federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma. Um, and then one that's not federally recognized, it's a historical tribe. Um, but our program is very, very diverse. And um, that eight counties, you know, there's a lot of differences culturally, geographically, opportunity wise, barrier wise. So we we definitely um, try to be creative and, and adaptive with our our clients and our consumers. Thank you so much, Rachel. And that's a great example of how, you know, they are unique in the diversity of Indian country particularly in Arizona. You know, there's so many tribes with 22 nations and some of them are the same tribe, but they're different bands or clans of the nation. So it's a unique approach to working with Indian country. And that's a good something, an outcome I wanted today was to show the diversity of Indian country and what we do. So thank you so much, Alan, for sharing. I, I'm sorry I put you on the spot there. <laughs> and uh, anyone else wanna share and have some ideas for us today? I have one more person, Dorothy. You were part of that talking circle 21 years ago, I believe, and uh, that created the American Indian Disability Summit that's going to have its 20th year coming up. Yeah. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing some of your perspectives of what we did in that talking circle and what we were able to produce with allies and partners. Well, you kind of put me on the spot, Jimmy. <laughs> that was a long time ago, but yeah, it was uh, amazing because there was nothing here in the Phoenix area until all of a sudden Jimmy appeared and uh, 
started with just inviting people to see, uh, you know, what what were the needs in this area, uh, and so there was uh, a great need as it as it turned out because there was so many people that had uh, various issues and were not able to get uh, those needs met by the local communities, and so we started talking about what would what would be uh, a, a you know good thing to to try to pull together if we could have uh, maybe a small mini conference of some type. And so that's when we first, I, I got uh, uh, involved then in, in trying to help find a location. Uh, and uh, fortunately I've been, uh, had the great support of my employers that have allowed me to help out with this uh, planning committee with the, with the starting of, of putting on the American Indian Disability Summit. And so the program first started through Native Health. They had sponsored the program for five years uh, and uh, many of their staff were, were committed to trying to make this be a success, inviting the as many uh, no, normal uh, lo other local uh, Native groups to take part. And so, uh, it has grown now to this next year, we will be celebrating 20 years of sponsoring the American Indian Disability Summit. Uh, and we've learned uh, a lot about uh, what uh, other agencies are around to provide services. And it's just been a wonderful thing. And so next year we will be having our event in March. Uh, we had to go virtual for a couple of years because of COVID, but this next year, this past year, we were, uh, the last two years then, we've been able to do a hybrid version and that's what we're planning to do again. And so uh, again, it's totally free and Jimmy's always been our star, you know, as far as uh, being, helping uh, to provide the uh, resources and and uh, he's been, I think a keynote or a couple of times now. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's just been an amazing experience, you know, helping people find the resources that they need. And we're trying to, we, we have been making more impact nationally as well, because we've had uh, several states that have been able to take part of representatives from other states, including Alaska, um, over the, by going virtual. And so uh, we also would like to, you know, hope to become a national uh, program a national conference as well you know so yeah it's been a wonderful experience uh, I've always enjoyed uh, learning about more resources and I think today's event is even I've learned a lot again today you know just about what employment opportunities there are so uh, again it's uh, I, I really appreciate all the help that everyone is uh, you know and the dedication I guess the the motivation that everybody has to try to keep doing better, you know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, you know very very all uh, been a wonderful experience helping you know learning uh, and working with Jimmy and and everybody else that's helped take part in our our program every year. So with that, I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Dorothy, thank you for allowing me to put you on the spot yeah. <laughs> to do that in the whole role as an educator right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's a long-term partnership we've had as well mm -hmm. and uh, i really appreciate your advocacy and your commitment to keep this going i know there was a t time or two where it could have failed and uh yeah. but it's but it continued <laughs> and that was as a result of empowering our native communities to say hey we want this yeah. as well as partnering with our non-Indian allies so we could make it happen. Yeah. California had one going, I think they lasted four or five years, but unfortunately just didn't have the support through the department. But uh, on that case, uh, Joshua, if you could, one of our questions was from someone from California regarding some of the transition and youth support mentorship programs. So if you could give an update on our Finds Their Way project, I'd really appreciate it. And thank you for joining us. I know you were with Frederica at Labor and we're creating national programs with her now. So good work. I hope it went well today. <laughs> I think that it did. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Joshua Drywater. Uh, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. CEO, Nagad, Kanji Stage, Dagwadal, Jijalik, 
I'm the program manager for Native Initiatives at the Sonoran Center, Utan Jun Del Quasti Dagi Dastane. And uh, within the Finds Their Way program or Native Initiatives, we have Finds Their Way program, which specifically targets uh, Native youth uh, with disabilities as, as they transition from high school into the career field or post secondary. Uh, really, uh, we like to see transition as not just an event that takes place once, but it's a progress. So uh, we've been working with a lot of uh, tribal communities in Arizona, developing uh, transition curriculum that is specific as we kind of talked about with the uh, specific community tribe and culture um, as they're varied, you know, there's 22 tribes in Arizona uh, as well as two urban populations as well. So, um, you know, we have been working with a school in the South to develop a specific uh, training transition curriculum that works for them, that uh, they really want to uh, see the transition path start as early as possible. So uh, we've been working with them to help build a uh, curriculum that starts uh, from ninth grade and as it transitions and they learn more about uh, work opportunities and get the soft skills, uh, the tribal VR actually comes in and we have uh, a, a handoff that takes place instead of, uh, I mean, what was what the tribe was saying that is oftentimes when the student would graduate, you know, they might drop off. So what we've been looking to do is kind of facilitate that handoff that happens between the transition specialist and both rehab. Uh, additionally, uh, we've also been working with the tribal education department to develop their specific tribal uh, or transition curriculum. And they're more in uh, the urban environment. So of course, as we mentioned, um, their, their transition curriculum and what they hope to accomplish uh, is different. And, you know, as, as Rachel mentioned, you know, being in Oklahoma in the South, Anadarko is a lot different than me where I'm from, Tahlequah, North, Northeast Oklahoma. So um, what we're finding is that each individual tribe uh, has their idea of what they would like to see. And um, one thing that I also want to point out is uh, oftentimes we see uh, you know, uh, statistics and stuff that um, talk about some of the di discrepancies and stuff. But as I travel throughout Arizona and meet with the different tribal nations, uh, I think it's important to really mention uh, that the tribes are doing fantastic grassroots things at, at the community level. And so I think a lot of the times when we look at some of the um, uh, ideas as we look for serving tribal individuals, a lot of that really is kind of assessing what um, that that tribe is currently doing and operating. You know, uh, Jimmy had mentioned that uh, oftentimes employment uh, could come through the tribal government, but also what the what the community needs. Um, so we've worked with several um, individuals, uh, youth, as we start talking about where we see them going forward and where they see themselves as they build those self-advocacy skills. And, um, you know, every tribal nation has a unique heritage, but there's very much a collective ontology view where it's it's not necessarily about the individual. And, and uh, we like to be able to uh, create these opportunities for our youth that don't require them to leave their family because that nucleus is a is a tight knit community. So that's why uh, we've also been working and partnered with Hanger. I actually met with a um, a um, a urban city school today, and we're looking to increase the work based learning opportunities uh, with the school and Hanger. So um, we have that going on and. Um, We've also been doing a lot of uh, the pre-employment training services that we talked about, partnering with some of the tribal nations to develop uh, pre-ETs in their uh, communities and with their schools. 
Uh, and then uh, also with, uh, I, I know I presented on Tuesday at the IDEA conference and several of you were there. Uh, I, and Anya presented with me, who is my native youth uh, coordinator. And really what we've done with the Finds Our Way program is uh, really put the, the native youth in charge of leading the activities. So they, uh, you know, I can act as a facilitator, but very much uh, Anya takes a, a leadership role and Gabe Martinez takes a leadership role. And really, uh, you know, as Jimmy mentioned, uh, I don't necessarily consider myself a youth anymore. And I know for a fact that our youth don't consider me a youth. So <laughs> it really helps uh, when they are the ones who uh, are developing these programs. And um, we have, starting September 6th, uh, we're gonna have a webinar series that takes place uh, after school hours. So from four to 5 p.m. Uh, that is led completely by Native youth that gives other Native youth opportunity, uh, a safe place to go to ask these questions uh, as, you know, they're, they're going through that transition phase. And I know um, we have different topics that we're going to discuss and help build those soft skills and self-advocacy skills. And, um, you know, if if you all have any native youth that would be interested in that uh, attending that program, like I said, we're going to start September 6th and it's bi-weekly and uh, Anya Carrillo, as I mentioned, is uh, going to lead uh, the discussion. She also performs uh, native uh, uh, youth leadership forums within the state. So we've actually, we had one uh, last year at Gila River and Last month, we had one at Diné College. So uh, if any of you are interested in partnering together on possibly bringing a uh, youth leadership forum to your area or uh, being one of our pilot sites, uh, we'd love to have you. And, uh, you know, I, I can travel. I'm down to travel anywhere. So we can, we can make things happen. And then, uh, as I mentioned with that webinar, it's going to happen biweekly. And... Uh, Anya Carrillo is going to focus on the uh, the soft skills and lessons, and then Gabe Martinez, who is my other uh, youth coordinator, uh, will be operating some of the more job club, job example focuses. And then lastly, I just want to say, you know, as I travel through and kind of get some of the, I, I know people had mentioned uh, possible ideas, you know, for some of these entrepreneurship opportunities. And as I mentioned, it really, uh, the more specific you can get to the community, the better and, and look for what the community needs or what the community wants. For example, I've heard of, you know, like a res Uber to help with transportation that could be led. Um, uh, I know one tribal nation uh, really wanted a car wash, you know, so it, they are able to uh, help the, develop a car wash business and stuff. But really, when, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, tribal members don't necessarily want to leave the reservation for a good job opportunity. So if we can find those, um, those needs and wants that are within that tribal community, I think uh, it, it really becomes beneficial to the client. Uh, Palamia, Joshua, and thank you so much for the work you do and what you brought your, I say youthful exuberance, but <laughs> you're starting to feel old like me working with our young ones. And Anya is a wonderful team member, and we're very proud of our young people that we brought on to our team that work with Joshua every day and creating these webinars and making sure that it is uh, appropriate and usable for our young ones. So uh, again, uh, thank you so much, Josh, for the work you do and uh, getting some of our young ones thinking about those unique employment opportunities. And maybe we'll do some internships over at Hangar or something. You know, you never know. We're still developing that. So um, any other questions, comments? We have 10 minutes left. <clears throat> thank you for all the uh, posts. We're going to have those in our so that we have this information available in our resource list because we want our website. Oh, someone asked if the web, uh, are, we do have uh, webinars archived on our 
Circle of Indigenous Empowerment website. I think I'm saying that correctly, Lizzie, or it might be on our Sonoran website. But we do archive all of our monthly webinars as well as these special you know, events, if you will, in this uh, particular webinar we're doing today. So that's what I was hoping was to have a bunch of resources and things that people can view and get some ideas so others that weren't able to join us today can get the benefit of what our discussion was and some of our ideas that we shared today in our mini virtual talking circle. So uh, any other comments, suggestions? Let me see. I have one new message. Oh, very good, Joshua. They're already working together. I like it. So we're making things happen. And that's what it's all about, is empowering our people through employment and making sure they still stay who they are as Indigenous people with disabilities. And thank you for the personal stories shared today. And some of those perspectives are powerful that re-energizes us to keep doing what we do. Because every footprint we make adds up to a long line of footprints and a trail eventually and a stampede, you know. So that's what I'm hoping for. And to our three presenters, Mel, Eric, and Amber, thank you so much. You all made some footprints today. And uh, who knows what we'll design with Hanger. And Amber, you can be our guinea pig on testing out some prosthetics, but you left some prosthetic prints today for the people of the Oyate. <laughs> So Thank watch you, <laughs> looking forward looking forward to it. But can can everybody share um where they're from and maybe their contacts as well? Yes, please. For folks, uh again, this is going to be available and the Native Center is a national program for economic development. And me and Amber are trying to create something. Maybe you could be helping us saying we want something at res regarding disability employment. And then Amber and I would have that support to create something through her center because they would see that as a need for Indian country. So again, thank you for your partnership again, uh, not only our three presenters, but also everybody that shared today uh, in our virtual talking circle. This is a, a wonderful collection of uh, perspective and information, as well as kind of a recharge for us to make sure that we know we're not alone out there doing these services for two cultures that, are, that have many challenges yet we still make it happen. And that's what makes me so happy to see uh, Anya and uh, Josh's team of youth doing it. And then me and my uh, seasoned friends out there that we've been around for a while. <laughs> but again, this is what we got to do in order to uh, make those footprints or wheel prints or prosthetic prints or whatever print you make. Uh, we've done that together collectively today. So anyone else have uh, anything from our team, closing statements before Lizzie? Does our close? Yeah, yes. I just wanted to make sure that we tell folks about the September 21st training. Oh, yes. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I sent that, Lizzie. So just here's a, hopefully you can see this on my, oh, my messy desktop anyway. But uh, September 21st, very proud to say we're doing our training at Phoenix Indian School. So we're going to be doing some of this, uh, again, disability inclusion. And it's open to all professionals, family members, tribal members with disabilities. It'll be a one day uh, session. I'm hoping to have fry bread available. We're working with uh, vendors to see what kind of uh, food. I'm hoping it will be a tribal member with a disability providing that. And again, the sessions will cover some of the stuff we covered today, but also some other uh, people that are gonna present. And I'm very proud that Treva Roanhorse, my mentor from Arizona, will be uh, sharing her perspectives as well that day. And, and then some of our partners is Hangar, as well as the National Center. So we hope to have all of our travel VR programs there, a representative to help share. And uh, we'll have the agenda finalized next week with speakers and the uh, times, but uh, we're very happy to have this. There's the uh, code there. I don't know if you can screen it, shot it or whatever, but uh, it'll also be on our website and we'll be announcing uh, this coming out with our Again, this is our partnership with Arizona Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. So again, we have our non-Indian allies that see a need to address Indian country and disability. So we hope you can join us for some fry bread, hey, uh, and discussions uh, with disability inclusion, not only for employment, but for the full gamut of uh, inclusion for our tribal members. So we hope to see you there uh, uh, next month, four weeks from today. Is that right, Lizzie? Yep, I believe so. And I shared that flyer in the chat. 